I don't want to be human. What am I? Hi there. I'm Chris Atkinson. Chris is a professor at the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Today I'll be breaking down clips from movie and TV about artificial intelligence and robotics. Out of control robots, I robot. Detective, what are you doing? Well, you said they've all been programmed with the three laws. Isaac Asimov was one of the earliest science fiction writers who focused on robots, and he came up with this scheme of the three laws. Yeah, I know, the three laws, yeah. Perfect circle of protection. Robots don't hurt humans. But doesn't the second law state that a robot has to obey any order given by a human being? Except if it causes a violation of the first law. Right, but the third law states that a robot can defend itself. Unless it causes a violation of the second law and the first law. We have 1,000 robots that will not try to protect themselves if it violates a direct order from a human. And I'm betting one who will. Gotcha. Get the hell out of here! What am I? You saw a robot that somehow its three laws were disabled, and that left it with an existential crisis. What am I? Which is sort of similar to what am I supposed to do next if I you know, don't have any guiding purpose? And if it was the case that robots ran on what we call expert systems or sets of laws, that might actually be a reasonable way to program robots. You know what they say, laws are made to be broken. But Nowadays, we're actually programming robots in a very different way by giving them lots of training examples and having them essentially learn parameters in formulas so that they do the right thing. So we have this mismatch between logical rules and numbers in a formula. So in robot movie after robot movie, they're obsessed with the robots actively turning against the humans and starting killing humans. And I, I get that. The goddamn robots, John! Far more likely is the robot will screw up. It will make a mistake. And that mistake will have bad consequences. Brother, it's a robot. It doesn't need a motive. It just has to be broken. Uh, deactivating an android, Blade Runner. <laughs> Should I really shoot the crazy robot that's coming to attack me? Yeah, shooting a robot is a potentially a pretty good way to stop a robot. Now, there might be parts of its chassis that you shoot a bullet through, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't cut any wires, doesn't open up a hydraulic fluid hose. So you might have to shoot it a bunch of times. There are other ways to disable a robot that might not uh, damage it in the same way. For example, there's something called an electromagnetic pulse, which will fry all its circuits, but leave the mechanics intact. Blade Runner's a fantastic movie. Thanks. It has this incredible vision of the future, which by the way, <laughs> we've already caught up with. Learning from imitation, Terminator. Hey buddy. Got a dead cat in there or what? <laughs> you whore. We're gonna program robots to have conversations and dialogue. And in many, many situations, you can anticipate what happens next. But sooner or later, the robot's gonna face a situation that's new. It doesn't know what to say. Got a dead cat in there? Uh, you know, the robot's gonna have to wing it. In this clip, <laughs> you asshole was the way to go. <laughs> you whore. A screen came up. And English words were there, and it sort of moved a cursor down and picked one. That's only there for the audience of the movie. The robots aren't going to do that. You know, it's all electronics, little transistors going blip, 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 and it's going to make the decision. Decided our fate in a microsecond. Programming the new Westworld. Did you see it? No. Give it a second, she'll do it again. Her finger. That's not standard. Occasionally in Westworld, you, you see a black box looks like a fancy keyboard in which they're sort of programming various sub-behaviors, let's call them, or primitives. There's been this controversy of, do you build up behaviors from a 
twitch here and a twitch there, or do you have a few fundamental behaviors and then you combine them? Ford, you must have slipped it in there without telling anyone. It turns out you can learn a lot faster if you combine these fundamental behaviors rather than adding up a lot of twitches. He calls them reveries. The old gestures were just generic movements. These are tied to specific memories. This is a spoiler. Things in Westworld go bad because they couldn't completely wipe the memory of a robot. The memories are purged at the end of every narrative loop. But they're still in there waiting to be overwritten. He found a way to access them. It turns out in complex machines, so you got lots of different kinds of memory in lots of different kinds of places. For example, the CPU is gonna have a little bit of memory in it. It'll also have something called cache memory. We have what's called a memory hierarchy. There's fast memory and then there's slower memory. Like a subconscious. A hooker with hidden depths. If you totally fried the machine, all you'd end up with is a broken robot. So you can't totally wipe the machine. It's the tiny things that make them seem real. Robotics lab, making Mr. Right. You look at that scene, you say, why is chemistry happening in a robotics lab? The future of robotics is where we make materials using chemistry to make soft materials. So that's actually looks very similar to what goes on in some of my colleagues' labs, you know, at Carnegie Mellon. I thought showing you these tapes might help to make you more familiar with the droid. We video record all our experiments, and in fact, often, you know, when we press an on button to say do something, that simultaneously turns the cameras on. Programming the android takes them just so far. The rest must be learned. Watching video feedback is very helpful to debug behavior. We had some difficulty with his gross motor functions before we modified his cerebral muscular coordination. Okay, so you just saw some mumbo jumbo. He's mixing things we'd say about a human who had a disease. We modified his cerebral muscular coordination. And a robot that doesn't know how to walk. Gross motor functions. My robots actually fell down much more than their robot did. Robot malfunction, Austin Powers. Can you design an input to a robot that will cause it to malfunction or crash? Only Austin Powers can do that. Yeah, baby! Multi-agent robotics, minority report. One area of research in robotics is what we call multi-agent robotics, which is to get a bunch of robots to work together. We model that on humans working together, like a sports team or when we're searching for somebody lost in the woods. Small robots in this clip would seem very smart and complicated. The, the dream in robotics is, can we make a lot of stupid, cheap robots that by working together get the job done? What we saw in this clip is they were using some kind of imaging radar to figure out where people are likely to be. Tom Cruise hid in, in the bathtub. That water shields him from radar, as you saw, but it also tries to hide his thermal signature. So he's hotter than everything else around him, and any kind of infrared imaging would have found him. That's why he dumped ice in the water as well. But, you know, if the robots have any kind of camera, they could have just looked down and, ah, there's Tom Cruise. So uh, I think we're gonna have to do a little better than that if we're gonna hide from the robots. Thermal Vision, Westworld. The Westworld clip is using what we call thermal imaging, far infrared imaging, where you essentially can see an image of the temperature of things that are out there. When the human got next to something that was much 
hotter, the movie tried to suggest that that would hide the human. That's actually probably not the case because the human isn't any less hot. And as long as the image doesn't do what we call bloom and the whole thing saturate, that robot should have been able to see the human just as well. <laughs> human Limitations, Battlestar Galactica. The five of us designed you to be as human as possible. I don't want to be human. I want to see gamma rays. I want to hear x-rays and I, I want to... I want to smell dark matter. It's highly unlikely robots are going to complain about their bodies. What they might complain about is our crappy computational hardware. I can't even express these things properly. A lot of it gets back to how do we build computers. And right now, for largely historical reasons, we separate out the thinking part, we'll call that the processor, and the memory part. And in order to really think about things, we've got to move everything in the memory part into the processor so it can process it. And it turns out that's really slow. And if you want to save stuff, you got to move it back. And that's really slow. If I'm so broken, then whose fault is that? It's my maker's fault. Google has something called a TPU, which they're optimizing to run something called neural networks. And they're building bucket loads of these things. And they're very, very different from standard computers. But I know I want to reach out with something other than these prehensile paws. I do believe that the way we build computers now is going to change completely in many ways. I'm a machine, and I could know much more. And if the robots want to help us do a better job at that, more power to them. Robotics Lab, Rising Sun. Why do we have guys in gold suits? I don't know why you'd wear gold suits. You certainly, in a clean room, wear some kind of suit so your dandruff doesn't ruin the chips. They look ridiculous. Jim, how are you? Captain Connor. So the people making the movie said, we got to get us some cool looking robots. But I've been told by reliable sources that only you have the next generation of technology to do this kind of work. So they actually reached out to what was then the leg lab, which was at that time at MIT. You're looking at early robots that eventually became Boston Dynamics. I'm getting out to a lot more Dodger games lately. The robot on the boom, I believe, was a Uniru, which it was a kangaroo-like robot. So the 3D biped is quite famous. It was you know, one of the first robots that didn't have a sort of protective system to keep it from falling down. Well, your reliable sources are wrong. And it did a lot of amazing things, walk, run, it even did flips. In contrast, the robot you saw earlier inside that, that building was on a boom, and it runs in a circle. What do they think of next? Design, Bicentennial Man. Have you given any thought whatsoever as to what age you'd like to be? Officially, I am 62 years old. Let's take off 25 years, what do you say? 15. 20. Perfect. Good. They use soft materials to make the face of the robot. Soft materials typically do what we call creep over long periods of time. The animatronic figures, such as the Disney presidents and whatnot, all begin to sag. Just keeping you on your toes. I don't have any toes. A big problem with robot skin is after a while, it gets worn, it gets cuts, it sags. It's actually a big problem because you, if you load it up with sensors and wires, it's a million dollar piece of skin and fixing it is a big problem. But otherwise, that's pretty much how you make a robot face. You have some mechanism and you cover it with some soft gooey stuff. Origami, Transformers. There are a lot of roboticists out there who want to build origami robots, robots that can reconfigure themselves by folding. That turns out to be a great way to build robots. Oh, no. Another area of robotics is more like traditional origami, where you have a flat sheet 
and you have a folding pattern and that makes a three-dimensional robot. Why is it a good idea to start things from a flat sheet? You can use any printing technology you want to lay down things like surfaces or materials. But most of these folding robots are on a smaller scale for structural reasons, so they're on the meter or centimeter scale rather than the hundred or tens of meter scale. Big guys, big guys with big guns. Robotic insects, black mirror. Colony collapse disorder, we, we still don't know what's behind it. Bees themselves were virtually extinct, so what our ADIs do is effectively stand in for them. This clip is very close to the truth in that people are trying to build robot insects right now. They can build things that are almost as small as a bee and that can fly. We simply set the behavior and leave them to it. They need rudimentary pattern recognition in order to locate compatible flora and navigate. They even construct these hives themselves. They, they reproduce. They reproduce? Yeah, each hive is a replication point. I was entertained by the hives, which had these sort of squarish honeycombs. It's like a 3D printer, basically. They also had a little bit of confusion about reproduction. They create duplicates of themselves and create more hives and spread out exponentially. They seem to suggest that there's this big 3D printer that's churning them out, which I wouldn't really call reproduction. I'd call that production. It's just a shame it's necessary. The alternative would have been environmental catastrophe. Bees were dying out. Are we going to have to make robots in big factories in the future, or are we going to have, find a similar way to just grow new robots? It's a big issue for robots. I didn't expect to find myself living in the future, but here I f***ing well am. Radiation, Chernobyl. All right, let's take this easy. Forward one meter, reverse one meter. Last one. Did you lose the signal? It's not the signal, it's the vehicle. It's dead. The problem with high energy radiation is you have chips, circuits, which rely on every part working. A high energy particle comes in and damages it, knocks out a trace or two, and the whole thing stops working. And they should have known that that was going to happen. I'm a little surprised at that. That robot was never going to work. An implication of this is why does military electronics cost so much? They anticipate high levels of radiation if you're fighting in the midst of a nuclear war. An amount of gamma radiation penetrates everything. The particles literally shred the circuits and microchips apart. All their equipment needs to be rad hard as well. It means the circuit is much more likely to keep working in the presence of high energy radiation. And that makes it fantastically expensive. I'm surprised at how good the old stuff was at predicting what's gonna happen. A lot of roboticists hate Hollywood. I love Hollywood. You know, give me more robot movies. It's very inspirational. Let's go out there and watch more movies.